I find that the mushrooms held me fall asleep. So how long have you been doing it for? Maybe a year now, give or take. Like, you know, I took them like everybody else in high school and college to like listen to Rusted Root and dance around the backyard. And like everybody, I think I was having a little kind of PTSD from COVID. And, you know, speaking of not being able to sleep, like I'm not making this up. I didn't even know what anxiety was. If you've ever had anxiety, you know what I'm talking about. It's like you feel like you're going to kind of throw up all the time. And I had no idea what it was. I thought I was sick. I went to the doctor. She's like, it sounds like anxiety. Have you ever seen a therapist? And I was like, no. And then I called this lady and within like five minutes, she's like, yeah, it's anxiety. I was like, okay, well, what do I do? <laughs> she's like, well, you talk to me first. <laughs> yep. Anyway, I do a lot of different things, meditation, you know, all that kind of stuff. Somebody introduced me to the mushrooms about a year ago and I've found that I drink less. And when I say microdose, like, I don't take enough where like, I'm like- 0.1 milligram or something. Yeah. I mean, even like, I'll just eat like a little piece of a cap. And I'll do it like when I get home, instead of drinking like a bourbon on the rocks after I get home from work. Yeah. Just eat a little cat. Yeah. And I get a notebook and I start writing ideas. And I did it for about a year and a half, I guess. I had capsules, so they were really sort of you know, dialed in to the dosage. But you had to do a macro dose first to really kick in the micro dose. So I did five grams first, like a serious full on trip, and then laddering up like 0.1 milligrams up to 0.3. And it was great for a long time. And then I was just like wired. And I stopped, but... Could have been the strain, too. I found a beautiful strain. I mean, I feel like I'm like pushing mushrooms on you, but there's a beautiful strain called Golden Teacher. Yeah, I didn't realize how many different you know varietals there are that have different impacts. I take this thing now like twice a week. I used to take it every day, and it actually was couldn't sleep at all. It's called Alpha Brain. It's another neurotropic. I've heard of it. And it's helped a lot. Honestly, I, I didn't know what stress was. Obviously, running restaurants, we always have stress. Right. I just thought it was part of life. I didn't, I didn't know it was a thing. Yeah. And then once, you know, I've had a couple of things throughout the years that like really hit me. And I was like, oh, shit. Recently, even like with Silicon Valley Bank, I don't know if you've heard about that crash, but we had all of our money in that. And so there was a four or five day stretch where I was like, holy shit. Wow. <laughs> That's my business. And uh, the post-traumatic sort of like episode after the day after that was just like, I need to step away. I do uh, fasting. So- I used to do intermittent fasting for like six years. Now I've been trying to put on weight, but every three months I do a five-day water fast. So just nothing but water for five days. And it is by far unequivocally like the best thing I've ever done for my body. Like I finished that five-day fast and I never feel better. I have so much energy. My body feels incredible. And it's also just spiritually, like knowing that you can go that long without food has all these impacts, not just sort of physically, but mental fortitude and also just gratefulness. When you don't have food for that long, you start to be really grateful for these little things. So that's been a big help for me because I don't really drink that much anymore. No, most of us don't. I think it's like natural. Your body just kind of tells you like, look, you can either go that way or you can go this way. It's up to you. Welcome to the Mies Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Sharkey, the founder and CEO of Mies, the culinary operating system for food professionals. On the show, I'll be interviewing world-class entrepreneurs in the food space that are shifting the paradigm of how we innovate and operate in our industry. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy the show. Yo. They say art mirrors life with every stroke of the pencil. I'm giving you folks a glimpse into my experiences. You could trace like a stencil. My guest today is the youngest American-born chef ever to win a Michelin star, and he's a New York City chef through and through. He was the winner of the Next Iron Chef competition, and he's the owner of his namesake restaurant, Mark Forgione, as well as several other New York City institutions like Peasant, American Cut, and his newest venture, One Fifth. Mark is an incredible chef and technician, and I've always felt that his food somehow always strikes this perfect balance of playful and cerebral while still being approachable and, of course, delicious. He has a soft spot for history and has a knack for taking over and reimagining historic New York City spaces, but something we didn't really get to talk too much about in the conversation, given his love for Native American culture is these vision quests that he goes on to sort of stay in touch with his inner self. Maybe next time. Although we did get a chance to dig into psychedelics a little bit, so I guess that counts. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Well, anyways, welcome to the podcast. (laughs) Stoked to have you here, man. Yeah, it's been too long, dude. I can't even remember the last time I saw you. I know. Well, I was thinking, I mean, this podcast is actually, it's a really awesome excuse for me to have conversations that I maybe wouldn't normally have with people I know and also dig in more. And, you know, we've known each other for like 15 plus years. I don't even remember how we met. 
I've always had tremendous respect for you as a chef, and just as a person, as you've just always been so kind. But I think probably most people, they know you as Iron Chef, Spark Fortione, and Michelin Star, the youngest kid to ever win Michelin Stars. But I think we both know, like, there's been a ton of adversity that you've had to go through. And I want to talk a little bit about that today in a number of ways, because, like, as I was sort of digging in your career, there's, like, these common threads of how you have dealt with them and like some forced impulsive decisions. I also think people probably don't really realize how much more of a challenge than a privilege it is to have Barry Forgione as your dad. I got to imagine that that was like a chip on your shoulder that you had to prove. So one day I'm going to write a book. Trust me. Yeah. I mean, just, just, just that alone to have throughout your career. And then obviously all that happened with Forge that became Forgione because of that whole debacle and opening and smack dab in the middle of the financial crisis and then the pandemic shutting down your business. And I mean, it goes on, you know, you take over Peasant, which as a chef in New York, that's a sacred institution. We all love that place. You've got big shoes to fill there. Riddled throughout your career, like as I was sort of digging in, there's all this almost forced adversity as well as like adversity that just came your way. I'm, I'm curious if you think your food and your business would be the same if you didn't go through all that. A simple answer to that is I wish I didn't have to go through all of it. <laughs> But it never, it never stops. It's just my life. It's always been like that. And even before cooking, my brothers and like, you know, my, my family, like we joke, it's not necessarily good luck or bad luck. We call it forge luck. And it kind of follows us all, like not just me, but not everybody like doesn't have adversity, but we just have some funny stuff. You know, it's like, you know, you just talked about peasant, like I opened forge and the world shut down. You know what I mean? Like, and my restaurant was two and a half blocks from the World Financial Center. <laughs> like, <Yep. laughs> it's like, what is like, like, like you know, like, like, what are the chances of that happening? You know what I mean? When you go to Atlantic City, I opened my first American Cut, in Atlantic City, and Sandy hit like three or four months later. You know, I took over Peasant, fucking January two thousand twenty. I mean, <laughs> it's like not better than that. <laughs> You know, it's just the way it is, man. I've always kind of dealt with it. Does that kind of affect like the food and the, and the way that I am? I think so. I mean, I'm always playing like it's the fourth quarter. Maybe that rubs some people the wrong way. I don't know, but it's, it's just kind of how I feel like I have to do it. And the, the, the ironic thing is, man, like I'm dealing with stuff right now that, you know, it's not people facing, but you know, like 22, I have to admit, it was probably the best year I've ever had in my life from a business standpoint. Forge crushed it. Uh, Peasant crushed it. We opened one-fifth. One-fifth was crushing it. And I st I'm not making this story up, dude. Like, it was New Year's Eve. I was on vacation with my family. I, like, went to Anguilla. That's where I got married. But I went there during COVID because my brother-in-law had a house. So, like, when they shut down the restaurants for the second time... I was like, I'm, you know, we're not staying in the city anymore. And we like camped out in Anguilla for like three months. But I used to walk this stretch of beach during COVID. And you were just saying like you had that moment when the bank shut down. Like I was walking this beach during COVID actually questioning whether I'm still going to be a chef in New York City. And I was like, maybe I'll just stay down here and like open a fish shack. Like, I don't know what is going to happen in my life. Like I would just walk on this beach. Like there's nothing else to do. Right? And... This New Year's Eve, I walked on that same beach and it was such a different emotion. I was like, holy shit, I've made it. And for the first time in like 15 years, I'm not making this up. I was like, I finally made it. Like, I deserve this. We deserve this. Sat on a rock and like, you know, took a moment, did like, yeah, you know. Yeah. And then New Year's Eve, I'm not making this up. I get a text. Gas just shut off at 7.30. The middle service at Forge with a full dining room. I swear to God, the gas is still off. Reed Street hasn't been open since New Year's Eve. It's just been like one thing after the other. And then never mind all that. I don't know if you heard, but we're moving Forge to the old Danube space. That was supposed to open in, you know, I think the original date was February. You know, we're still not open there. We're trying to get reopened so that we can like send off Reed Street in the right way. But it went from like me like celebrating on a rock and it only lasted like four or five hours. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy, man. Well, I mean, it's also crazy. Like, again, people have this perception of, oh, 
Mark's got all this shit figured out. And 15 years later is when you start to feel like maybe you have it figured out. And I think the only way to look at business is good things are the anomalies. Like that's the, that's the anomalies is when the good shit happens. They're just problems every day. And as long as you like, no, tomorrow something fucked up is going to happen. I also think that COVID had a good way of putting things in perspective too. I don't know about you, but I deal with problems in such a different manner now where when you look at your life, like face to face, like you were just talking about like your water meditation, when you had these real, we'll call them real problems, like, holy shit, like I don't think I'm going to be able to live in my house. Like I don't think I'm going to be able to feed my family. Like, like those are real problems, not we only did 80 covers tonight and we wanted to do a hundred. You know what I mean? It kind of puts it in perspective of like, what's a real problem, what's not? And then it's like, you know what? We'll get the extra 20 covers. We'll figure it out. Let's all take a deep breath. Where I think maybe before COVID, it would be like a little more drastic to figure out how we're going to get those 20 covers. Now it's like, let's take a deep breath. We'll get it. Don't worry about it. Hey, like, you know, like somebody broke a window last night. All right, let's get it fixed. Josh didn't show up for work today. Okay. Somebody else will work the station. Like, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't know about you. Like I, I always find like the little things that happen more often throughout the week, the month, those are the ones that actually perk me the most that I, that affect me the most. But whenever like the real shit hits the fan, that's actually like where I thrive. You have no choice but to just step back and be like, okay, what's essential? What actually matters right now? Because at any given time, all this could crumble, <laughs> you know? Fragile. Yeah. It's funny because that's how I was looking through all the shit that happened in your career and it continues to happen. It's sort of built these calluses for you. I think from the outside looking in, it, it seems like because I'm Larry Foy Jones' son, that we probably grew up in a mansion surrounded by a farm fresh ingredients, and I eat cedar plank salmon with caviar sauce for, for dinner every night, <laughs> which couldn't be farther from the truth. Trust me, I grew up in the very humble house in the suburbs of Long Island. Like it wasn't like anything fancy by any means. And then I think again from the outside looking in, it seems like it was just like destined, and it was. Oh, my dad probably opened this restaurant for me and he gave me the money. Again, man, it couldn't be farther from the truth. You signed the lease with no money, Zero. right? Like you didn't even have any money. I think we had like a hundred grand in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> That's ballsy. I could never do so, that. And it, trust me, man, I'm telling you, it was hard. You can ask anybody that was there. It was not the, the way that it may have looked like from the outside. And even like the Michelin star and the, and the Iron Chef stuff, like it was just like crazy out-of-body kind of experiences that weren't scripted. They just happened. And, you know, you also mentioned kind of seat-of-the-pants moments that's like you had to grab. I think a big reason that we got the star was we were probably one of the few restaurants that didn't kind of succumb to serving kind of quote-unquote bistro kind of food just to serve the masses. And I got into a lot of fight with my partner at the time. You know, I just said, look, I'd rather close than, than do that. Like, well, I've worked too hard to finally open my own place, which was a crazy decision, but it ended up working. The next Iron Chef, I didn't cook turkey for Battle Thanksgiving. Again, on the outside looking in, it seems like pretty crazy to not do that and ended up working and taking over Peasant. Like you said, man, that's a big, you know, and I'm not like complimenting myself. And if it sounds like I am, I'm not. But not a lot of people can handle taking over a restaurant like that. Now it's a lot of stress. You could have seen the people that came in the first month or two, like the regulars. I mean, it was, oof. <laughs> I can only imagine, man. They were like, I want the mushroom risotto. I was like, I don't know how Frank made the mushroom risotto. I mean, I'm sorry, but I'll give you this. <laughs> <laughs> that was a pretty impulsive or like forced impulsive decision too, right? It was insanity. I hosted an event for the New York Food and Wine Festival at Peasant because I loved Peasant. Peasant was one of my favorite restaurants. And I just gave a speech to the crowd, like when we gave a toast before the event started about how much I love Peasant, how much I love Frank. Frank is like every chef's spirit animal. I mean, works the station every night. He's 58 years old. He doesn't give a shit. I don't think he has Instagram. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, he's not on TV. He's just a chef and the food is great. And this restaurant couldn't be more beautiful. And he designed it himself. Like it was bare hands. Anyway, I gave this speech after it. He like pulled me aside. He's like, I'm retiring. Nobody knows. And I was like, holy shit. And then he called me like three or four months later. And he's just, he asked me, did I really mean everything I said during the speech? And I was like, well, yeah, of course I meant it. 
in his own roundabout way, he just basically like asked me if I'd be interested in peasant and I, and I had to like stop him for a second. I thought he meant maybe like cook there for like a week towards the end or like be part of like farewell. And then I just had to like ask him point blank. I'm like, are you asking me if I want peasant? And he's like, yeah, what the fuck does it sound like I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and we did a handshake deal in September and I opened in January, which that in itself, that three months was... I mean, we opened the restaurant in three months. I mean, it was bananas. Yeah, that was a big deal. I remember when all that was going on. Similarly, you're scaling all these restaurants now. You have a bunch of different businesses, but a lot like Frank, you're in the kitchen all the time. You love being in the kitchen. Are you familiar with the, like, the zone of genius? There's like these four zones, the zone of genius, the zone of excellence, the zone of competence, and the zone of incompetence. And incompetence is probably obvious, and so is competence. But the zone of excellence is doing the thing that you're really good at Maybe not necessarily that you love it, but that you're good at. And the zone of genius is doing the thing that you are really good at and that you really love. And that seems to also be something that is a thread throughout your career. You love cooking. Almost like you have to have a business because you want to cook food. <laughs> Otherwise, maybe you wouldn't even have one. And your food is very cerebral and it's playful, but it's also like really approachable. My mom still talks about the hamachi crudo when I, when I took her there. But it's really technical. Like it, it's not easy to execute all the time because there's a lot of technique. And you are in the kitchen all the time, but you have a lot of kitchens now. So I'm curious, how do you sort of cultivate that same culture of technical proficiency and execution? And how do you maintain consistency as you have all these growing businesses? I think a simple answer to that, and I, I don't know if I do it on purpose or if it just happens, but I try to contagiously show everybody that works, not just in the kitchen, but in the front of the house, how much I do actually care, not just for the food, but how much I care for them. You know what I mean? Like the first thing I say when we're opening, like, you know, we just did one fifth, so it's fresh on my mind in August. The first thing I said to the entire staff, I'm going to respect you guys and you guys are going to respect us and we're going to care about each other and we're going to, it's a family. And I know it sounds cliche because, you know, every corporate meeting you ever go to, like you'll, you'll hear the same thing. And I think you can even see that sometimes when I say that to the group. But after like a couple of weeks or a month, one by one, like people will just come up to me every once in a while and just be like, you know, a lot of people say it, but they don't really do it. This is great. I've never worked anywhere where people actually like have each other's back. Instead of sabotaging, it's like they have the back. And when it comes to my chefs, I'm really blessed. I have three really great chefs right now. But I think that's not just the technical cooking part, I think I try to show them the emotional attachment that I need them to have to what they're doing. Like, there's the best technical guys in the world. And I've had some of the best technical guys in my kitchens, and that doesn't necessarily mean they're the best chef in there. It really, truly really doesn't. I'm, I don't know, I'm sure you can kind of understand what I'm saying there. Like, And the guys that I have, maybe they're not the most technical three-star Michelin chefs in the world. But like my guy at Peasant, Greg, he will jump in front of a train to make sure that Peasant is doing what it should be doing. You know what I mean? And, and he's down there. And like last night I was at Peasant and he's during service, you know, he knew I was there. He's like, yeah, I just got to bang out a few things, you know? And I go downstairs and he's got 20 pounds of short ribs in, you know, three different hotel pans. He's got the pasta wrapped, ready on the wood board, ready to roll out as soon as he's done cooking the short ribs. He's filleting some bronzino. And, you know, like most executive chefs, if the owner is there expediting, like they get a little kind of free time, right? They get to like go down, maybe go in the office, maybe come up and expo a little bit. Like he was down there with his sleeves rolled up. And I didn't ask him to do that. And I think that's what I'm trying to get at. Like he's drank that Kool-Aid. I'm going to do everything I can because... I care. Connor, same thing at, at Forge. Like, I didn't know if he was going to be able to do it when he got the promotion and typical, like, worked his way up kind of story. And he was in there with a drill, taking the, the seats off of all the chairs that need to get reupholstered. It's the executive chef of the restaurant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It sounds like it's more important that they understand why they're there. They care. I'll take somebody that cares and teach them how to make a, a beautiful pot of pho than. Somebody that knows how to make a pot of pho but doesn't really care when I leave. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't want to go down this rabbit hole too much because it turns into the, the wrong conversation. But do you think cooks have changed over the years? Yes, but not just cooks. But also, too, I, I think I can 
touch upon this. I'm scared for the next generation. I know you are, but at the same time, our parents were scared for us too, and probably their parents too. And it seems really scary. I hate to say it's not the kid's fault, but it's these 22, 23 year old kids, then they were, they were raised in a cradle and a cradle that was taught to them by adults. Oh, you don't know how to do something? Well, I don't know. Ask your phone. I hate to say it's not their fault, but it's not their fault. They, they don't think it's, it's wrong to put one earphone in while they're prepping for service that night and listening to whether it's a, a podcast or or a movie or a fucking song. Like, I don't even know. Like, I just look at them with like face like this. Like, do you think it's okay with me standing right there? Like, you know what I mean? That's the part that I think is the funniest part. It's like, they're not hiding it. Like, we'll, we'll have the snucker game on the, you know, and it, you know as well as I do in a weird way. You almost don't even want to like get involved with telling them they can't do it because they'll fucking shut down. They'll go into like an emotional cave. I, I agree with you. I don't think it's their fault. It's and it's the it's the wrong way to look at them to sort of villainize them. It's just they have a different. They were taught that you can do anything and you don't have to conform. And a lot of that is great. And a lot of that, especially as it relates to craft like cooking, can be dangerous. So I don't want to be the ones who well, this next generation isn't going to have the same proficiency as as the previous one. I do worry about techniques not really carrying over if you skip the 10 years of learning to just go right to being the boss. Yeah, man, you know, as well as I, it's not going to go away. I do think that with those same kids, if you can try to just teach that emotional caring about what they're doing is the best way that you can do it instead of telling them what they're doing is wrong all the time. 100%. But I think one of the things that has not just hurt young cooks, but also restaurants is it's so hard now to I hate to say be different, but to be unique because it's just so easy to download anything. You know what I mean? Like, what do you want to make? You look it up online and there's 20 different recipes, 20 different pictures from 20 different chefs, some of them amazing, some of them not. So it's like, I don't know about you, but, and I still do it. I did it last night. I didn't have a plan of this razor clam dish. Like I showed up and Greg told me he had razor clams and I find that my best kind of work usually comes unscripted and yeah, I went in the walk-in and like we had pickled ramps and you know, there was green garlic that just came in the first batch of green garlic and I saw oregano and I was like, ah, oh, you know what we'll do? We'll do like a, a cool fun play on clams oregano. But I didn't pick up my phone and Google clams oregano. I didn't look up images. I didn't like look up ratios. Like I just kind of grabbed some stuff and it took three or four tries wasn't like we just put stuff together, threw it in the oven, and it was it was there. But it took us like I don't know, a couple hours, two or three tries, and we came up with an amazing dish that now you're eating clams oregano and using the razor clam shell as the spoon, which was nowhere near where we started with that dish. And I think that is something that's getting lost in cooking. Is and I see it like when I ask somebody to make me a blank. The first thing they do is they pick up their phone and they, which again, is okay. It's not like, like, at the end of the day, it's like the new age cookbook. Like, you know, you and I, we went into cookbooks, right? I mean, so I have 300 of them in my house. I'm not like saying that you shouldn't do research. I just, I think that there was something a little, like you had to work harder with the cookbook and you had to kind of read into the recipe as to why maybe something works and why it didn't. And now it's just kind of like swipe right, swipe left. I think the personal touches of using, for example, the razor clam shell as the spoon. I don't know if we would have gotten to that point if we had just looked up razor clam oregano. You know what I mean? Yeah. In the long term, you can't really fake intent. And that comes through in the food. Whether a guest knows it or not, they can feel when something was birthed from the chef in the kitchen and, the, and the, their sort of iteration of that. I don't think that you can fake that, at least over time. Maybe one night, one week, one month, you can sort of get some buzz from it. And also, no matter what, they have to come back, right? So you have to make something delicious no matter what. I definitely want to dig into like your process of ideation, but you know, to wrap up the, the new generation, I do think, look, there's still going to be a, obviously a, a lot of incredible cooks. My one worry, and this might just be unfounded, is that some of my closest friends in the world that I would like jump in front of a bus for that I've known for 20 years are the ones that I was in the trenches with, you know, in the kitchens working 
you know, 12, 15, 16 hour days, six days, doubles. And there's a bond that comes from that. You can't really replace that. And I wonder if that's now just gone. I don't know because I haven't been a cook in so long, but I, don't, I wonder if that's gone. Well, that's a great point because obviously you can't even do that with kids now. You get arrested. Great point. I, n- I never really thought about that. Like my guys, you know, like Pet, you know, Chef Akio now, Ed Cotton, now doing really well actually. You know, like the names that I'm thinking of, Pinot Feo, Christian Lomas, to your point, those are the guys, you have know, Gavin Portsmouth, that those six day, sometimes seven days. Back then it was, you know, you did a hundred and plus for lunch and you did, you know, 200 for dinner and you prepped everything. It's hard to actually imagine how you did it. Like I take a step back and look now, cause you know, my guys get in at three and they have prep cooks, prep cooks prep it and then they show up. And like, I wonder when I look at these guys, could this kid actually do a lunch and a dinner service and be responsible for his prep? Then I, I don't know. I mean, I think it'd be hard for me to imagine. Are you familiar with Parkinson's law? So essentially, if originally it was the gas, a gas will fill the, the size of the room that it's in, but it, it then sort of like started being used to depict business and, and productivity. Basically, the premise is the more time you have, the more time you will use to complete the same amount of work that you would with less time. And you're a parent now, so you know, like we have less time in the day, but we still have to get the same amount of things done. And that premise, I think, carries into a lot of how business changes over the years. And look, I'm not saying it's wrong by any means to have like a 40 hour work week or to have you know, the breaks and things like that, but you're going to get the amount of work done in the time that you have. And unless you realize that you can get more done, you probably won't. You know, it's funny you just said that. So my family is away. I think for the first time, he's, my, my son is four. So it's probably the first time in four years that I'm living in my apartment without my wife and my son. I don't wish, man. <laughs> Listen, they left on Saturday, and I will fully admit, I was kind of lost. Nah, sorry, I take that back. Saturday felt like, this is awesome. Like, NCAA was on. I cooked myself a steak dinner. I played my electric guitar with the amp, which I haven't done in forever. Like, it was like a guy's day. You know what I mean? Like, great. Yeah. Sunday, not so much. Like, I missed them a lot. And then Monday, there's, there's going to be a point here. I'll, I'll get to it, but. Monday, I woke up and like, you know, you know, as well as I do, there's breakfast time when you wake up with the kids, right? 6 a.m., you come out, you know, you're in your robe, you pour your mud or your coffee, whatever it is, you feed your kid, you do the whole thing, you get them cleaned up, you take them to school and you look up and it's fucking, you know, 9.30 and now you're ready to start your day. So Monday, I kind of came out and I was like, what the hell do I do now? Like, this is nuts. (laughs) So today's Wednesday and... I can't tell you how much stuff I got accomplished yesterday. I actually worked for the first time in a long time, a 12 hour day. I got to work at nine o'clock, so I had a nine o'clock meeting. I got home last night at 1030. You know, like I was just saying, I made a new dish at Pheasant, like I had meetings at one fit, we did that. Like I couldn't believe everything that I got done. And then this morning, you know what I mean? Before I even talked to you, like, you know, I sent out a couple uh, different things. I wrote down recipes that needed to get done. I went to the gym, you know what I mean? Like. To your point, like when you have the kid, you still have to get it done somehow. But now that I don't have the kid, it's like, ah, oh, you know what? I got plenty of time. I used, this is three hours that I didn't used to have in my day. I know, man. You know, it's tough. I keep waking up earlier and earlier to try to sort of go for a run in the morning. But now I have to get up at like 5 a.m. now. But I find it's you have to try and figure out how to get more done. And I think one of the other blessings of having kids is that you're forced to prioritize. Okay, I know I can only get this much done. So what isn't getting done today? And that helps too, because otherwise you're like, yeah, you can crank everything out. But when you have to decide what not to do, that's a harder decision. And you keep the things that you should get done, I think. Yeah. It kind of happens like natural selection almost. Yeah. This podcast is brought to you by Mies, the culinary operating system for food professionals. As a chef and restaurant owner for the past 20 years, I was frustrated that the only technology that we had in the kitchen was financial or inventory software. Those are important, but they don't address the actual process of cooking, training, collaboration, and consistent execution. So I decided if it didn't exist, I'd do my best to get it built. So the current and next generation of culinary pros have a digital tool dedicated to their craft. If you're a chef, mixologist, operator, or generally if you manage recipes intended for professional kitchens, Mies is built just for you. 
Organize, share, prep, and scale your recipes like never before. And get laser accurate food cost and nutrition analysis faster than you could imagine. Learn more at www.getmes.com. I'm going to jump around a little bit because you were talking about like creating dishes. You just created the, the new peasant yesterday. I wanted to maybe sort of dig into like your process of iteration because you have like all these very classic dishes, chili lobster, chicken in a brick, hamachi crudo. I mean, it can go on. There's a, there's a ton of them. And I actually don't know anybody that has as many sort of like classic <laughs> dishes as you do. But A, like when does something feel done to you? And like how often are you like tweaking something as, as you're iterating on it? You know, again... If it sounds like I'm complimenting myself, I'm not. It's more just like kind of explaining. I've never had an issue, I mean, even to this day, with coming up with dishes. To like flip it, like, you know, some people can write music. Like, I wish I could be a musician. I, I wish I could write songs. I try. My songs suck. Like, I read them after a week, and I'm like, I crumble them up, and I throw them away. And, you know, some people can write music. You know, some people can draw. It is what it is, right? I have notebooks and notebooks and notebooks of dishes that not like I've made all of them, but they just ideas. So like that kind of creative part of it has been something that has been kind of natural. But when I start to actually make them and cook them, I think the ones that I guess become classic, I used to do this weird thing at Forge where I would stand, you know how there's like that open door in the kitchen? I would kind of stand there and there was, there's like certain nooks that you could stand at and watch people eat without them knowing that you're watching them eat. <laughs> For example, like the chili lobster, like it's not just the dish. I would watch people eat it and some of, some of them would look confused when they got it. Well, I don't know how to eat this. You know what I mean? And then you'd watch the server come over and explain it. And then they, again, some would smile, some would make a face. But I loved that it was like creating like this moment of, you know, we just talked about it like, there's not a lot of places that you go to in Manhattan that you have to pick up a lobster in its shell with your bare fingers in a fancy restaurant, quote unquote, you know what I mean? And poke the meat through the thing and get kind of possibility of getting da 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 But I used to watch this and it just, it got me like so juiced. I knew that this was something special, you know? And it's kind of the same thing like with the hiramasa, the, the tartare, and like the, when you give people the, the Szechuan button, like there's just something that, that happens to people. Like you said, I think you said your mom still kind of talks about it. I hate to say stupid chicken, but the stupid chicken, like it's the same kind of thing. Like there's nothing really crazy about it that when it comes to the table, the people's eyes light up like every time, every single time. I don't care if you've had the chicken a hundred times, when it comes to the table and you get excited, like you're going on a roller coaster. But I didn't create any of those dishes with the thought that they were going to become classic dishes. Like the whole mantra of Forge was we're going to change the menu as I see fit. Like we're just going to change and change and change and change. The ones that stuck the most are the ones that people got, you know, you better put that back on or we're not coming back. And over the years, and it's funny we're talking about this because we're getting ready to reopen Forge, we hope, soon. I'll send it to you, but I just wrote little snippets on, there's like 10 of them on the dishes and where they came from and how they were created. And going through that was like, it was kind of like a, a meditation of going through, through your mind. But I promise you, not one of the dishes that is on like the quote unquote classics list, did I look at somebody and say, this dish is going to like, you know, crush people. Like the chili lobster came on because I was hung over and working brunch. And most people don't realize this. I mean, it came from because I ate chili crab in Singapore, but I was hung over and I wanted to make like a, a spicy special. I think it was more for me to eat than it was to actually serve. And the first chili lobster was chili lobster with an alamanute pan sauce, which we definitely don't do anymore. <laughs> Put over scrambled eggs with toast. People liked the scrambled eggs and the spicy lobster. And then it was like, oh, well, you know what? We'll do this for dinner. And it just kind of, turned into its own little animal and the chicken true story man it was left over from a lamb shank special that my sous chef ran on my day off he had keeper shallot butter <laughs> you know a note remember the old notes that you'd leave in the little west 
You know, there was a note that said, hey, chef, I ran a lamb special with uh, rosemary roasted potatoes and caper shallot butter. came out really good. Da, 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 da. But, you know, we didn't have any more lamb, so I tasted everything, and I wanted to do this brick chicken, da da da, da. And that, like, that's how the chicken started. It wasn't this, like, this chicken is going to change the world. You know what I mean? And it sounds like things stick around when you see that, that sort of ephemeral reaction. That's why I was telling those stories about, like, the ones that, there's just something about it. And I will, on the flip side to this, I don't know if you found this as a chef, not all the time, but I would say probably more than not, the times that I think I have created a dish that is going to blow people away. <laughs> <laughs> people are like, that's yeah, good. And you're like, what? Yeah. Like, what are you talking about? This thing's not again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's infuriating, man. That's why you have notebooks and notebooks of ideas because you never know which one it reminds me of little Wayne. someone asked him like oh what do you have like 80 90 songs in your backlog he's like no i have like thousands <laughs> i recorded 53 last night and you know that's that zone of genius so that's the thing that you that you do is you just keep pumping them out and you never know yeah and you never Back know to what i said too about like you know the the musician stuff you know i play the guitar i would say that 95 percent of the greatest songs of all time are the simplest songs to play that you've ever imagined. You know what I mean? It's like E-A-G. Like, it's all it is. You know what I mean? And it's just beautiful words, you know, sung in a beautiful way. Yeah, and probably influenced by somebody before them too. <laughs> so it sounds like you have a lot of ways in which you come up with ideas. I know for sure ingredients also, like uh, you have a forager, I'm pretty sure, right? Don't you have a forager that works for your company? I, I don't think I answered that maybe the right way, but like I, I get inspired by anything. It could be... From McDonald's to a three-star meal that I had to maybe something I saw on TV to, I, you know, as well as I just sometimes you go to somebody else's restaurant. And it's just a matter of then, no pun intended, like forging it into your own voice. Yeah. We had Lior on the podcast. He's the um, best. A week or so ago. And I didn't realize that you actually <laughs> started Le Bois Spices with him. He wasn't really doing spices. And then you and Laurent were like, hey, can you start doing some spice blends? I imagine that there's a bunch of inspo that comes from that too. I think Pierre Poivre was the first one. I think it was BLT Market. I mean, we wanted to do a steak au poivre. Or Concali, maybe Concali was the first one. I don't remember. I have to look back at my notes. I love Lior. I think he's such a pure genius. I mean, you want to talk about somebody working in the zone that they should be working in. Like, he's just an amazing human being, you know, an amazing dad and an amazing husband. And he's the best, dude. And he's honestly, like, he's probably in like, uh, I don't know, put a percentage on it, but if I have nine classic dishes, he's probably in four or five of them. Yeah. It's so cool to see his approach to thinking about spices and spice blends. That's so, I don't know the word. You would never think about like different textures in a spice blend. You know, that's not something you think about. He does. So yeah, I love the guy as well. You know, we're talking about like the process of iteration and you've certainly created this culture as well in your kitchens of how this food is getting created. Wiley, who you actually just did a, you did a partnership a while back with, with Peasant, he said something that I really like. Part of creating that culture is creating a culture where it's okay to talk shit to the chef. And which <laughs> that was awesome. But how do you think about like bringing your team in to these dishes that you create and, and where does that sort of push and pull like? You know, it's like 50-50 with that. You know as well as I do. You've been in this business long enough, right? Some people can create, some people can't. Like it doesn't make you a good or a bad cook slash chef. Just not everybody has that that kind of gene. I try as much as I can. Again, not to like hate on young cooks these days, but it's it's tough with the younger cooks. Again, kind of for what the reasons we already talked about. Like you know, they get in at three. Like you know, service starts at five. Like you know, they're kind of just like service people at this point, which is sad. When it comes to like the creating with the chefs, like the sous chefs and the, and the chefs, you know, again, I try as much as I possibly can. But I'll be the first one to admit, you know, I might send an email, for example, that says, and I'm kind of doing it right now, like we're like putting spring stuff on at one chef and, you know, I'll give them a day or two. And, you know, if I come in and they have ideas, like, you know, we start to go with it. But if they don't, then I just kind of say, all right, well, then we're going to go this way. But I think an easy way to answer that is I welcome as much collaboration as possible. I think the best way to answer that is that it's not as like, quote unquote, free flowing or easy too. I mean, listen, the chefs get pulled in a lot of different directions now too, right? I mean, there's a lot of technology stuff. So like 
people create recipes. They have to like put stuff into the computer and they're, they're weighing stuff out. And I think sometimes that kind of gets bogged down. And I also think that I'm like a quote unquote safety net too. Like they know like, okay, well, if we have a couple ideas, like chef will come in and we'll figure it out and it'll be, you know, we'll figure it out. And I say that to them, you know, I want you guys to come up with stuff. Here's some ideas that I have. If not, just have this stuff prepped. I'll be in at two o'clock. Yeah. I'm curious how you think about, and this is going to sound bad, earning the right to share ideas. I think, you know, back in the day, and I, I hate saying that back in the day. It sorry. is back in the day. It's okay. You know, when, when we were growing up, I, you know, I remember I would go in, I would, even though I had a 12 hour day, I would come in early to butcher fish to learn. And I would stay late to learn how to bake bread. And I had to have my station set. And if I wanted the chef to like show me how to do something, I remember Rick Moon and yelling at me because he was showing me how to make this emulsion with red peppers. And I didn't have all the mise en place, you know, set up for him. He's like, he walked away. That was the day I realized, okay, it's on us as a cook. If we want to learn, if we want to share, if we want to do things, then first we have to have all of our shit together and earn the right to share. And I don't know if that's a harsh way to look at it, but I'm curious how you think about that sort of paradigm. Yeah. I mean, again, I hate to keep talking about pre-COVID, but I think that pre-COVID, there was a little more pressure in that way where I might ask somebody to have something. If they didn't, you know, I might kind of slam something. Now it's definitely a little more free flowing where I'll just kind of suggest maybe to somebody, hey, you know, try this that way. And, you know, this is what I'm looking for. And I might come in the next day and he's still not doing it. It's kind of more like you just said, you have to earn it. Like I'll kind of look at them and say something along the lines of like, if you want to be on this level with me, like you're going to have to have this ready the next time, man. Like I, I can't do this, you know? And I think that kind of hits them home a little more than the slamming of the the pot or the the thing. You know, again, to use your term, like back in the day, it was a little different. And in a weird way, I don't know if the kids like really care that much about impressing. It's like they just want to like get through the day. I know that that's depressing, but it's like, yeah. Yeah, maybe the motivations have, have changed a bit. Right. And I, for the life, I can't figure it out. Like I look at the line, I love them all to death, but it's like, I, I don't know. I just don't know if I see any. Yeah, yeah, and and it's not. To, it's also not to say I think that like the screaming is any more effective. You know, I remember Eric Repair walking up to me when I, I was cutting chives for a dish of his, and he just walked up to me in my ear and he said, "Those aren't right. Can you please make them over?" In the nicest tone ever, and I was crushed. My dad said that. You know, he he didn't have to scream or yell or anything, and it was like like the most polite way to tell me and. It was way more effective than screaming or throwing something. My, my dad was like that. My dad was a, a silent, like, he, he would kind of say things like, if you were cutting the chives the wrong way, like, he'd come up behind you and say something along the lines of, like, if you were sitting at the table and you saw those chives paying the amount of money that we charge people to eat at this restaurant, and you just, God damn it. And I don't know if that's more effective than I remember getting plates thrown at me and why do you even come to work every day and things like that. And that also motivated me. So I think it depends on the person, depends on the situation. And yeah, you know, to your point, I mean, I used to yell. I don't yell anymore. I can't even tell you the last time I yelled at somebody. I do the disappointed thing now. But even then, it doesn't really happen that often. It's like I don't let myself get disappointed. And again, I'm very lucky I got these three guys that are really running the kitchens in a good way. Well, you talk about all the ways in which you get inspired by a dish, but another thing I see, and this is probably just common in New York because New York is always rebuilding itself. Every space was something else before, but all of your spaces of all your restaurants have pretty cool backgrounds. And a lot of them, I mean, I, I worked in Tribeca, you know, 15, 20 years ago, and I remember what Dwayne Park before it was Keogh, and I think Forge was like the deck or something like that, or American Cut was Cinque Terre. All your space is now one fifth, which is that's been like a restaurant for, since like World War One or something. Is there like some sort of affinity that you have for historic spaces? And does that play into how you think about food? Yes. Again, kind of going back to like when it's like a classic dish, like I don't think I set out purposely, at least not in the beginning. I think as in kind of, you know, when I was getting interviewed, like, you know, you're taking over, rather than like, you know, like why? And, and I started to like explain and I wasn't bullshitting and I'm not bullshitting. It was very important to me that a place like Peasant doesn't turn into anything other than a restaurant. And in today's world, like you know as well as I do, I mean, how many restaurant spaces are just gone? And whether they're a bank or a cell phone store, whatever it is, you know what I mean? So 
whether it was a coincidence or not, I don't know, but I think maybe that like planted a seed in my own head. And then when I saw that the one fifth space was available again, to me, it's like another one of those iconic spaces that if that was to turn into anything other than a restaurant, like we're, we're doing it such a disservice. Now Danube too. I mean, it's the same thing. Like that's such a beautiful. Are you keeping any of the red or any oh, of yeah, the... Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to see like, you know, we stripped it down to its bones and I don't know if you remember those gorgeous pillars that were in there, the black with the gold top. Again, it just has like such beautiful bones and these giant windows and these like 25 foot ceilings and but again, that could easily be what Boulay is now, you know, another bank. And and it's like, it is crazy and it's sad, dude. And so I'm not going to say I'm on a mission to save restaurant spaces, but if I see a space that has that kind of clout, it makes it a hell of a lot more attractive and I'll do what I can to kind of like keep that going because I think... Not to sound cheesy, but you know, there's something about the soul of a restaurant and that's why it makes me so sad that I'm leaving Reed Street, but it's just like, there's nothing I can do with my landlord situation and it, it's such a sad shame and I hope he gets smart and lowers the rent to where it's supposed to be and somebody can come in and keep that place going. Yeah. Yeah. It's unfortunate, but it, it definitely seems like it's becoming a part of your brand and, and, and what you do, which makes sense, honestly, because you, you had a legacy to carry on and redefine with your dad. And I don't know how much, you know, that, that subconsciously has played into this, but you seem to have this sort of desire to rebuild and redefine. Well, I care about the New York city restaurant scene. I do. I'd love it. And I always have. And as the next generation, you got to take the baton. And I'm trying, man, it's ours, <laughs> you know, and I'm doing everything that, that I can to help pass the baton on to the next guy. You maybe you don't think about this yet, or maybe you do, but I mean, it's been doing this for a very long time. Like what, and now that you have the name Forgione, you don't know, mean something and not just anymore because of your dad, but because of what you've done. Like, what do you hope is like your lasting impact on the industry, your whole umbrella of what you're doing? Well, to kind of touch upon things that we've talked about, you know, I, I just started a hospitality group. It's called Respect Hospitality. And I hope that, you know, when it's all said and done, talk about taking the baton, right? I mean, listen, you know, as well as I do, it, it can't be the old days. And I'm, I'm really trying to like start this group. When I told my business partners, I wanted to name it Respect Hospitality. They were like, you know, that puts a lot of pressure. You got to really walk that walk if you're calling this respect hospitality. And I kind of looked at them and I said, I know, like, that's the point. We're going to make sure that people, you know, respect is a word. I mean, especially in the restaurant industry, it doesn't stop. Like there's, there's nowhere the word respect stops, whether you're respecting the ingredients or respecting being on time or respecting the guest that comes in or respecting the person that answers the phone, you know, respecting the way the bar looks like, like it just, it doesn't stop. It's respect. Yeah. The space that you took over. 100%. <laughs> And the history that it had. You know, I hope that when it's all said and done, that we have a bunch of respect hospitality restaurants and people understand why I decided to name it Respect Hospitality. And, you know, I don't run from my dad's name, obviously. It's, it's in the forefront of everything I do and always will be. But I do hope that when it's all said and done, there's people understanding it was Mark Forgione and not just Larry Forgione's kid. You know what I mean? Because trust me, I still walk into a room and they're like, oh, you're Larry's kid. <laughs> yeah. Well, now you got your own. Right. Ho hopefully someday he walks into a room and they go, ah, oh, you're Mark's kid. <laughs> yeah. But maybe he'll be a musician and he'll have a thousand songs instead of a thousand food ideas. So <laughs> Mark, this was awesome, man. We could probably talk for another three hours, but I, I know you're busy. So thanks for coming and chatting with me. It's been way too long. Of course, brother. And congrats on everything, man. I know you're always out there. You're always pushing. You're always hustling. You're always thank you coming up with something new. And not to be funny here, but I, I, I respect everything that you do. And keep pushing. And anything you ever need or want from me, you, you just let me know. I appreciate that, man. Thanks for tuning into the Mies Podcast. The music from the show is a remix of the song Art Mirror by an old friend, hip-hop artist, Fresh Daily. For show notes and more, 
visit getmes.com forward slash podcast. That's G-E-T-M-E-Z dot com forward slash podcast. If you enjoyed the show, I'd love it if you can share it with your fellow entrepreneurs and culinary pros and give us a five-star rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. Keep innovating. Don't settle. Make today a little better than yesterday. And remember, it's impossible for us to learn what we think we already know. See you next time.